Welcome, my name is Pete Frizella. I'm a developer advocate on the Google Analytics team. And so thanks for coming, Nick. Uh, so today we're gonna to talk a little bit about the uh, Google Analytics Metadata API. How to use the Metadata API, uh, what does it mean for you in terms of uh, development and maybe some products that you might be working on. And then we'll talk a little bit about this new thing, which is the data deprecation policy. The metrics represent the numbers, the numerical values, and the dimensions represent the strings or text that break down the metrics uh, on various criteria. For example, the source and medium. So the big question is for developers is what are the dimensions and metrics that are available that you can use in the reporting APIs to query for your data? Now take, for example, what we have a tool here is a query explorer, what we build. In the query explorer, we allow users to build different queries to query our API and get that reporting data that we showed earlier. In the query explorer, we have a section for people to select dimensions, for them to select metrics. When they select them, we show groups, all the different dimensions and metrics. We even show descriptions. Now, we built this tool because we know the product and we work on the product team. But for developers building interfaces like this in their own product, it can be very difficult to stay on top of all this data. And so what we did is we packaged all this data and we released it in what we call the Metadata API. With the Metadata API, you have access to all this data programmatically. So let's just take a look at what kind of this, what this looks like, and, and this is the actual response back from the metadata, metadata API, right? So we have a new endpoint um, under metadata, and, and then you provide a report type, and, and then the resource is called column. So when you actually visit that URL, let's go back up, you'll see the actual response. This is coming directly from the server, right? So we have all this. So this actually, is a live. This is live. This just came oh, directly wow, request. Oh wow! Right? That was really fast. Yeah. So it comes back, and we get all this great information that you just described, right? It's the stuff that you need to kind of build these. Core reporting API or, or other Google reporting APIs um, is the ID. This is kind of the important part of this, and it represents the entire uh, dimension or metric. Uh, and that's the name you actually use uh, when you query for the reporting uh, reporting data, right? So in this is it, in this example, we have average time on site. That's the ID, um, and that's the kind of information you get back. The other thing is that we've uh, provided all these list of attributes um, that that makes sense to have when you were trying to build a UI. That the stuff that you're going to need to know, right? And we can kind of group these into different areas. And, and the first area that we want to talk about is the type um, attributes. And there's two of them here. Um, and they, they provide two pieces of information that are obviously essential. One is, the is this a dimension or metric, which is the type attribute mm -hmm. uh, that identifies that. And then we have the data type. And this lets you know, for this particular dimension or metric, what is the data value that you're getting that's being returned. Is it time? Is it maybe a percent? Is it a float, integer? So this is things like that. formatting. Exactly. So yeah. you can understand okay. what the format of that value is, right? right. Because when you look at JSON response, these are all basically strings, strings that you're getting yeah, back, yeah. right? And this tells you the actual data type for that. The next thing is that we provide is kind of these, uh, we can just think of as like description or UI attributes, right? So uh, you'll notice that we have these groupings available for you. And this is stuff that we provide that the Google Analytics team has, has kind of grouped these di different dimensions and metrics into uh, kind of similar groupings that, that'll be helpful when you're building a UI, for example. Um, so this is, you can use it or not use it, but it's, it's, it's helpful for that in, that mm -hmm. in the situation, right? Um, so every, every uh, dimension of metric is going to have this group attribute, and just to help you with that. And then we also have things like the UI name and the app UI name. So depending on whether you are, have set up a web uh, property or an app property, app profile, um, there is certain dimensions and measures that have different names um, depending on if it's app or web, right? And if there is a particular name for an app uh, UI, then we'll, then we'll provide this, this extra attribute uh, as part of the response for that particular uh, dimension or metric. Uh, so you want to check that when you're, when you're using the metadata API. Uh, you want to check the response to see if that exists for that particular dimension or metric and use that depending on whether, whether you're building an app or, or web uh, interfaces. Mm -hmm. Then we provide description, which just gives you a little description of what the actual dimension or metric is. And then we provide this additional calculation attribute uh, again, this get, provides more information around if it is a calculated metric, which some there is a few that are calculated metrics. Um, this will show you the actual uh, dimensions, metrics, or other metrics that we use to, to to actually come up with that calculation. So these are all very helpful building out your UIs, just as you described. Um, the other thing is that we have um, there is particular dimensions and metrics that are that have these repeated values. So if you have like a numeric index, um, so something for example, we have custom dimensions and metrics. You'll notice they have these double X's uh, as part of the ID. And what that means is that there's a, there's a particular range for that, that, um, that dimension or metric. So we provide these attributes that, uh, per, that give you the boundary or the range that, that is valid for this particular dimension or metric. 
Um, and this, this helps you understand either for validation purposes or if you want to build out a list of dimensions and metrics that are valid for a particular uh, repeated value, this will, this will provide those, the, the values that you need to know for that. And then finally, we have the, uh, some attributes that you can think of as helping in terms of validation. Um, so we have an allowed in segments um, attribute. And this just helps you identify whether a particular dimension or metric can be used in a reporting query uh, as a segment. Um, and if it, if it is allowed, then this, this attribute will exist. If not, it will not exist. And again, this is helpful for validation and making sure you're provi um, building queries out that will, that will work properly. So it's, it's, it's a whole bunch of great stuff in terms of the, the data that we provide. It gives you, I think, pretty much like a, a good, good coverage on all the stuff you're going to need to build out, mm -hmm. build an API, right? The final thing we want to talk about here in terms of attributes is um, this e tag value. So you'll notice when you when you make a request to the, to the metadata API, you'll get a response back, and there'll be an e tag attribute. And what this is is a unique identifier uh, that that you can use to determine whether the response has changed since the last time that you requested it. So if there if you make the response and you cache at client side or server side, and then you make an, uh, another request later on, if that value matches the value you have stored, the e tag value, that means the response has not changed. Mm -hmm. And this is helpful for a few reasons. One is um, you can, if you've maybe got a response and build out a UI, you can use the e tag to determine if you need to update that UI. Because if the value hasn't changed, there's no point in updating your UI because nothing's changed since the last time you requested it. The other way you can use it is when you make a request to the Google Analytics servers, um, to the metadata API, you can actually include this e-tag value as part of the headers. And then the, re the response you get back will depend on whether the value you provided is the same as what already exists on the server, or it doesn't. So if you send the e-tag value and it's the same, we'll respond back with a 304 response, which is a not modified response. And you can then you'll know that there's no changes. If you provide the value and your response back with a 200, then you'll actually get a new response. That means there's a new response, and you have to update what you, what you have on your server side mm -hmm. or your client side. So it's really helpful saving quota. And this is really probably useful for mobile, because you don't want to be sending a lot of data back and forth on mobile. Um, and actually, when you make the request to the metadata API, you can specify a fields parameter and specify just to request the e-tag value if you'd like. Uh, so it's really useful for caching and, and making sure efficient use of, of the API and quota. So let's talk a little bit about the data deprecation policy. This is new, right? With the with we introduced. Yeah. So one this. of the things that we're introducing with the metadata API is a new data deprecation policy, uh, and this covers how we add and change data within Google Analytics reporting APIs. So when we add new data, we'll add it. We'll announce it through the change log, and then the data will automatically appear through the metadata API. So if you're actually building any products using this API, they'll automatically be updated, which is fantastic. The second thing is when we decide to remove data. In the past, it was uh, you know we would announce it, but there was nothing formal. So today we're formalizing it with this API. When we when we announce a deprecation of data, what we'll do is we'll actually message the change logs, and then it will be available uh, for a minimum of six months. After which we'll remove it. And what we're doing is to message user interfaces to keep them updated. Where it's actually a new status parameter that we'll set to deprecated. By default, it's public. And so once it's deprecated, you can actually update your interfaces to start changing them. And then finally, in the cases where we want to replace, sometimes we'll rename a different dimension and metric. This will also go through deprecation, where we'll announce the change on a change log. The data will be available for the old name will be available for a minimum of six months. But we'll also introduce a brand new parameter that's called the replace by parameter. And it actually returns an ID that points to a different entity that's the replacement, a different uh, dimension or metric that's the replacement for the one that's being deprecated. So what's great about it is now with the metadata API, for products that have integrated with it, they completely can be compliant with all the deprecation policies without having to push new uh, releases to production. So let's take a look at some of these uh, attributes. Yeah, see how actually uh, you know how it manifests in the actual response. So you'll see that there's uh, a few different attributes here, like Nick, Nick, Nick mentioned, which was the status. Um, so when this gets deprecated, this will change from public to deprecated, and you should always be checking for this value to make sure that the, that the dimensions and metrics you're using are still valid and, and can be used in a query. Um, and if it does change to deprecated, then you definitely you want to be checking to see if it's been replaced maybe by a different mm -hmm. ID. And if that's the case, then we'll also include this replaced by um, attribute, which then points to the ID um, of the, the obviously the dimension metric that's replacing this particular one. Right? Yeah, and I think the good thing about this is that if many people will build saved reports within their products and interfaces, so if you do see something that's deprecated, you will want to make sure you go back and update 
or, or warn your users that either the queries will stop working in the future or just go ahead and update them with the replace by so that way they don't see any disruption of service. Yeah, yeah. and if you don't do this, uh, well, ultimately at some point it'll be removed and you'll get a, a bad, resp uh, bad request response back. Yeah, and it'll so. be a bad user experience as well. Yeah, exactly. OK, great. So we covered a lot, but um, but you know it's a it's a very simple but powerful uh, API, I think. So this is, you know it's really easy to use, um, and it is really powerful in terms of what you can do in the UI and things like that. Uh, but we do have a lot of resources available if you'd like to learn more about this API and, and how to use it. We provide some code code snippets and examples on our developer uh, site as per usual. And again, if you're going to use it, uh, register in the API's console and get an API key that you can throw it together. And then we have some a new data deprecation policy that uh, you know, we encourage you to read and, and review. So if you're building applications, you understand how things will be changing in the future. Um, but that's it for today. Uh, we wanted to keep it short and simple. And uh, we, we want to thank you for joining us again. Uh, and we hope to see you next time. Thank you very much. Yep.